being someone that's attracted to hated commodities, like what's your what's your sense around the appeal of gold and gold equities at the moment? Well, we're going to make a lot of enemies this hour. <laughs> that's what we're all about, Rick. Leave all the uh, friends to the paid interviews, mate. <laughs> we, we don't need money off companies. Right, if you haven't listened to our show before and this is your first time, boys, big message. We don't get paid by companies. No, we're, we are fiercely independent. Matty, we do get paid by mining services companies. But we don't adjacent. get paid by mining companies to fluff them up. We, re- we refuse to promote. We think it's bad alignment with the audience. Yeah. 100% lads. So if you are enjoying the show, give it a, a subscribe, a like, or whatever, a five stars. Just spread the good word of money of mine so we can keep bringing you wicked chats like this. Right, Righto, let's get into Rick Rule. Five star on Spotify. Five star as well. <laughs> Just and- tell everyone you know. Right, let's get into it. Right, we've got the main man back. Jesus, been oh, what six nine months now, Rick? It's good to have you back, mate. Jeez, you you catapulted us. Uh, well, thank you. We'll, well give I'm, you a bit of give you a bit of recognition there, Cobber. I'm delighted to be back. I'm fans of you all, so just so as you know, uh, think of me as a very old fanboy. Uh, <laughs> uh, at least we don't have to translate as much. Uh, now we're, for the North American audience, now we've got you on for today, mate. Are you one of the ones in the comments just commenting every every episode, Rick? Is that you? <laughs> the, unlikely the, the unlikely me. That requires more technological capability than I have. Oh, I'll set you up with a YouTube account. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. Now, Rick, for those who... Now, we, we had a brief chat before about we know you're an early investor in things. You like to catch things on on the way down, uh, cheapskate as you described uh, described yourself. And we want to talk about that. We know because last I know last time we talked about uranium and you seem to have got in there pretty early. And is that prophecy sort of becoming true for you? Yeah. I, I mean uh, – you may or may not recall uh, our first visit, but I used the slogan that in capital intensive cyclical businesses like resources, you are either a contrarian or you're going to be a victim. Uh, uranium was deeply out of favor. There was no narrative, but the arithmetic was very good. It was costing the industry about 60 US dollars a pound, totally loaded, you know, including cost of capital and social rent uh, to produce a pound of uranium and they were selling it for 20. Losing 40 bucks a pound and, of course, being miners trying to make it up on volume. Uh, And that wasn't going to work. You know, the price had to go up. So that's why I bought it. Did I buy it too early? Yeah, absolutely. Two, two and a half years too early. Uh, On the other hand, uh, a basket of well-constructed juniors, which mercifully I had, generated sort of 300 or 350 percent gains. Two and a half years is not too long to wait for a 300 percent gain. Uh, I think in uranium, by the way, the easy money has been made. When a commodity passes from being hated to being tolerated and sometimes liked, the easy money has gone. But I think in uranium, for reasons that we can discuss later if you want to, that the more sure money is ahead. You may remember, too, that when we talked, lithium was all the rage. Mm. And I sort of said, well, it had utility. The market was nuts. Uh, It was ignoring arithmetic. And mercifully for me, I got that one right too. I suspect two years from now, lithium will be regarded as a four-letter word, (laughs) irrespective of its English English, uh, spelling. And I suspect I'll come on your show and say, you know what, provided you'll have me back, uh, the time is right for lithium. Everyone hates it. But people still want batteries. That's just the way this shit works. <laughs> <laughs> That's the four-letter word. So, yeah. Rick, uh, I mean, on, on lithium, there it's been pretty, pretty hated, pretty maligned lately, and a lot of people talking about how it's starting to get deep into the into the cost curve and starting to hurt some people. How do you sort of see that? You obviously said in a, in a couple years' time, are you saying it's nowhere near hated enough? Yeah, so much money got raised, and so much money got spent, and so much money got found that we're still building lithium capacity. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you want to see something that's a little more proximal, look towards nickel, uh, where they're shutting down sulfide nickel deposits around the world. I I still believe, because of the increase in supply coming out of Indonesia, that uh, nickel has more pain. But I think it's a year and a half ahead of lithium uh, in terms of market disruption, 
I mean, the first real good sign of market disruption is uh, when existing capacity gets shut in. Uh, the way mining works, because it's so capital intensive, the producers will produce down to cash break even and sometimes below cash break even, uh, attempting to win the last man standing contest, attempting to exist uh, until prices go back up. And so you have to destroy capacity uh, in order, first of all, to make a, a rebound imminent, but also to make the market hate the commodity enough that speculators aren't hanging around for the rebound. And lithium isn't close to that yet. Uh, you know, the, the price of lithium over seven years went up, what, fivefold? And then it fell by 60%. So you need to ask yourself if you have a sense of history, is the lithium price up, <laughs> which in seven-year terms it is, or is it down, <laughs> which in terms of two-year terms it is? Uh, I'm not saying, by the way, that you need to get out of the lithium trade anymore. I was saying that in our first visit. Uh, but the knock that we've seen in lithium and the knock that we've seen in lithium stocks is probably sufficient that a highly intelligent speculator who understands the truly high quality lithium deposits that will stand the test of time, people on the lowest cost quartile at the same time as being in the best cost quartile in returns on capital employed, they'll do okay. But they're going to have a psychological test getting through the next two, two and a half years. I, I think you're, you're bang on there. And the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is BHB's Nickel West operation. And they're just trying to keep it on losing, I think, 50 million bucks mm. a month, just trying to stay in the game. Something else. In that, that case, JD, they're, 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 they're probably not going to keep it on. They're just, they're just you know, they're, they're playing games with the government in order to try and get oh, think, some yeah, free I'll, government money, which sure, uh, are, I'm sure Rick will be. Uh, Rick, I heard, some it, commentary on I heard that. at the pub <laughs> that it's pretty much guaranteed to go into care and maintenance. So if it's at a pub, <laughs> That's bloody, you can't get more gospel than that. <laughs> uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of both good and bad information. Out of both. <laughs> <laughs> but nickel, nickel's an interesting one. Oh, uh, is there, can you draw any parallels with uranium in terms of, like one of the big catalysts for uranium recently has been the lowering of production coming out of Kazakhstan. So if you're looking forward, forward for nickel, it's very similar. All the all the production is coming out of Indonesia. So, like, if you couple that with the fact that, right, if something goes wrong or something changes in Indonesia, is that a big potential future catalyst for nickel while it's in the doldrums yeah. at the moment? I, I think you are prophetic. I think you think you put your finger on it. I flew over Sulawesi, southern Sulawesi, not too long ago, uh, and nobody would describe me as, you know, Greta Thornburg's brother or anything. But seeing the environmental degradation that's occurring in southern Sulawesi around those laterites shocked even me. Uh, and I was around mining in the bad old days, pre-stripping by pushing material into the salt water, <laughs> not oh, yeah. deep water disposal, but rather tide water disposal. Uh, deforestation on a scale, <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't laugh, but I have a sneaking suspicion, uh, having spent a bit of time in Indonesia, that even though the Indonesian government uh, will be tolerant of that type of activity, Indonesian people won't because the scale of destruction on Sulawesi is mind boggling. I had read about it and until I looked out of a plane window and saw it, I had no idea of the scope and scale. Yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty eye opening, but we haven't yet seen that the, uh, the Western buyers of the nickel are willing to, to pay more unfortunately, in the in the cases where you see that sort of stuff. And the, the other thing that really comes to mind with nickel that a lot of people are talking about is a, a structural shift as a result of the, the change in technology. Does that change the lens in which you look at this beaten up sector? Uh, I'm afraid that my track record with regards to technology is unblemished by success. So <laughs> if I have an opinion on technology, I try my best not to not to pay attention to it. Uh, I certainly understood something about the fact that in the pig iron business, basically you pay for the nickel and you get the iron for free, uh, which is why that you know lateritic nickel for steels and stainless steel makes so much sense. In terms of technologies that might evolve, 
uh, let's just say that there's no incentive anymore to conserve nickel. There's no incentive to substitute other materials for nickel. There's no incentive to generate uh, technologies that utilize nickel more efficiently because nickel for what it's used for is pretty good and it's also cheap. What I've discovered in my life is that the cure for low prices is always low prices. Uh, low prices stimulate demand at the same time that they constrain supply. Uh, your listeners who went through first-year economics will remember what happens when supply goes down and demand goes up. Prices follow after a fashion. And I think that'll happen in nickel. Whether or not that'll be exacerbated by technology is a question that you need to ask somebody your age, not my age. Now, sorry to cut you off there, Rick, but everyone's talking about this nickel and the rise of it for EVs and battery cathodes and that sort of things. But not many people are talking about the use of nickel in DSI bolts at all. I, I didn't think you were going to go there, Matty. I thought you were going to talk about how shit the nickel ground is and the fact you need ground no, support. No, no. Well, that's a, <laughs> that is another thing. But to get to that point, now, fun fact, a little bit of nickel is used all across DSI for bolts. It's used in the steel bolts. A bit more is used in the high strength bolts for the hardening and the steel properties. Mate, they can even use, they can even make a stainless steel bolt that uses a shitload of nickel. And nickel's also combined with the zinc to improve the galvanized coating. So I think the rapid growth of DSI that we are seeing on the back of this partnership and the demand for how good that bloody business is could revive the nickel industry. So the nickel people aren't talking about it. Mines are getting deeper, so you need more ground support, and the the nickel that you mine goes into the bolt, so that you can mine more nickel. Exactly. To feed the bolts. So you're also saying if you want to support the WA nickel industry and support the nickel industry as a whole, you've Get got DSI. to buy more DSI anything, all all of this stuff. Just put an order in. BHP, call DSI because that nickel. They need more nickel off you. It'll indirectly to, it's save them. It's just a them. big yeah. circular reference. It just it's just a wheel of nickel. Yeah, going around. So they mine the stuff, send it out to Qdow, buy it back essentially. I can't, I, can't, I, I feel just I can't believe we've got to spell it out to companies in this way to use DSI because they should have been using DSI already anyway. But we're handing it to you on a platter. Support the nickel industry, support the mining industry, and get DSI as your ground support supplier. Well said, and Rick, support your own stock. Rick Rule yes. loves DSI. He told me off air. Yeah. <laughs> Even Rick Rule loves it. There you go. Right, let's get back to Rick. So back back on uranium, Rick. Um, we we've had a good few chats with people that seem to be quite in the weeds in uranium, and they they're always talking about how this is a, you know, the the supply side of the dynamic here is what's really causing all the all the ruckus, and is why they are bullish the commodity and bullish the stocks and bullish everyone in between involved in the, the nuclear and uranium trade. And I'm interested to hear from you how you uh, view the supply, sp supply response this time around as opposed to the, uh, you know, the famous run in 2007. Well, let's look at where the supply might come from. Uh, the Kazakhs are obviously the most obvious. Um, and it would appear the hotshot production, which is to say care and maintenance production, could generate somewhere between 15 and 20 million pounds. Uh, and, and then you add back 10 to 15 million pounds for Cameco. In both cases, the companies have said publicly that they won't restart production until they have enough material contracted for, not sold at spot, but rather contracted for, at a price uh, that justify that provides a reasonable return on capital employed, uh, in turning, including sunk capital, which means uh, if you take them at their word, which at least in the case of Cameco, I do, it means that the new supply additions won't be disruptive. It means that they won't hit the spot market. They'll have to be sold in the term market to CGN probably, or they won't come on the market. Then you look at other brownfields, uh, higher median cost, but you probably have another 10 million pounds of total production, which could be brought back in the sort of three-year or four-year uh, time frame. 
And, and then there's some piddling supply additions, mostly in the United States. Uh, and, and when I say piddling, I truly mean piddling, uh, two to four million pounds. You have that uh, against a shortfall of primary uranium supply relative to current demand that's running 55 or 60 million pounds. And the difficulty is, not the difficulty for the uranium speculator, but rather the difficulty for the consumer, is that for the Greenfields projects, assuming that the directors decided to push the button today, permitting the mines, financing the mines, and building the mines is going to be a seven or eight year process, irrespective of the price in the near term. The second thing that's important about uranium, and I don't see any of the pundits talking about it for some reason, is that the structure of the uranium market is changing. Three and a half years ago, almost all the trades took place like every other commodity in the spot market. There wasn't a futures market. Uh, and so all the trades were sort of overnight trades, meaning that there was no price certainty for either the producer or the consumer. In those days, good for the consumer, lousy for the producer. But that market has really, really, really changed. Uh, it has changed for a couple of reasons. One reason is my former employer, Sprott, took 50 million pounds of supply out of the market. That went to supply heaven. The Sprott Trust is a roach motel. The pounds can go in, but they can't come out. Uh, which is interesting. So the spot market became very, very illiquid. I think it's the over, over that, 60 now, isn't it? In that spot uh, yeah, uh, physical trust? Yeah, yeah, total. But remember that we took it over with 12 million pounds. Yeah. We, bought, we bought 50 and change yeah. after we took it over. <laughs> 50 and change. It's funny. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these new build plants in particular – uh, often have a lender requirement that the plant builder secure sufficient uranium over a sufficient period of time that it amortizes the loan. <laughs> and that makes perfect sense. The cost of uranium relative to a nuclear power plant is very low. The real risk to the, to the uh, power plant is not necessarily the price of uranium, but rather, have, than have the, but rather having access to it. And what that means, I think, for the next 10 or 15 years after this market breaks in is that you're going to have price certainty around uranium, around the producer. The producer will know the floor price that he or she is going to get for as much as they care to contract. If you are, let's say, Paladin, and you are trying to take your balance sheet, <laughs> uh, your prior track record, uh, which you know was a little checkered, into the credit markets, uh, a lender like me is going to be nervous. If, however, you take those pounds uh, into a bank with offtake agreements with China General Nuclear, Ontario Hydro, or Ontario Power, pardon me, Southern Company, Duke Power, with investment grade counterparties so that the bank knows what price that uranium is going to sell for, that's going to increase the sense of security that the bank has about getting paid back and it's going to lower the cost of capital. At the same time, it's going to do that. It's going to increase the visibility of revenues and cash flow to lazy security analysts my, like myself. And they're going to be more certain about the upside in their price assumptions. And I really think that the next part of the bull market in uranium is all predicated around uh, term contracts. There are some guys, including my friend Amir Adnani, who don't want to contract pounds. They don't want to give up the upside. At my age, if you learn, if somebody takes away all of your downside, <laughs> they can have a bit of your upside because the upside is still pretty good. So sorry for that long-winded explanation, but it's strange that the whole uranium <clears throat> market is changing in front of our eyes and most people don't see the change. Can, Rick, can I go into that example on on Paladin a bit a bit deeper, I mean, we, we saw recently they announced, um, you know, that they, they've taken some debt in their capital structure. And, yep. you know, without, pure, you know, insight into are there floor prices in their, their contracts, et cetera, then, um, like, wouldn't you as an investor in Paladin get get nervous seeing what what you know is a, a marginal project that doesn't, um, you know, it's it's got a history of becoming distressed throughout the full tenure of the 
of the uranium cycle, wouldn't you get nervous seeing debt in that capital structure? It depends on the debt. Uh, it depends on the contracts. What happened to Paladin is that they built that mine in anticipation of $65 uranium, and they woke up after Fukushima to find $15 uranium, <laughs> which was pretty ugly. Uh, if, uh, as an example, they had a turnkey build contract, so they knew what price they were going to pay to build, build it for, even if they paid too much, and they could be assured of $70 a pound for, say, 5 million pounds a year, <laughs> I wouldn't be uncomfortable about that at all. Uh, I've, I've been a resource lender, uh, including a project lender, <laughs> including in the early days a lender to Paladin, for my whole adult life. And I have never seen a commodity before where I can have five-year, 10-year, and 15-year price certainty with only upside, no downside. Now, of course, that depends on the taker. If the taker in the supply contract is a sort of a fly-by-night fly commodities, uh, you know, commodities brokerage with a dollar ninety-eight in equity, that doesn't count. But if the taker is Tokyo, Tokyo Electric uh, or China General Nuclear or Duke Power, you know, an investment grade counterparty. And I know that they've contracted for X million pounds at X price. That loan gets a hell of a lot better. What do you, what do you think about what Johnny Borsch off the, ba the baby kiss is up to in uh, Deep Yellow? Because they look to be about, they're going to be 60 to 70% debt funded and 30 Ks away no, from. He says that. He won't get it. Laying a high <laughs> drink and rec reckons he's going to be, uh, uh, there's going to be no floor, floor prices, uh, sorry, ceilings on these uh, contracts he's going to be getting. Uh, what's your take on what they're up to? Well, with the caveat that John Borshoff is one of my favorite human beings in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, uh, now toted as the baby kisser. Uh, thanks from to you. Our, that, last, that one? <laughs> our last one. <laughs> you say well, it I'm, sounds I'm, inappropriate. It's I, not. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm no baby, so I'm in no danger. Um, <laughs> well, John and I, John and I have split the odd beer. Neither has ever attempted mercifully to kiss the other. <laughs> um, back to your question. Uh, John is a very aggressive human being, and. If he succeeds in debt funding that project uh, as to total per, uh, as to seventy percent of construction cost, uh, and uh, I can see that he has done it without uh, sufficient uh, term contracts to amortize the debt, <laughs> I'll sell my stock. Simple as that. He is one of my favorite human beings in the world. And if he decides not to have learned the lessons from Paladin, uh, he'll go down that rabbit hole without his old friend, Rick. Mm. Rick, what are, what are some of the other lessons you think people might be glossing over this time around in, in uranium? Oh, God, there's so many. Uh, I mean, the biggest stupidity, of course, is fear of missing out. Mm. Uh, you have people who are attracted to uranium because the price has gone up. You're supposed to be attracted to it before the price goes up. Uh, you know, the fact that the price goes up justifies the narrative that nobody had the balls to utilize when the price is down. Uh, now, when people are going to have to focus on understanding opaque term contracts, despite the fact that understanding these term contracts is the key to making much surer money than has been the case hitherto, People will say, that's too hard. I'm going to do something else. <laughs> People never seem to learn these lessons. People, I, I, saw a, I saw a posting from the PDAC that was supposed to be um, complimentary, saying uranium is hot, which is to say uranium is favor, in favor. And that's the worst thing I can think of about it. Uh, something that's in favor means that the story is well enough distributed that the upside's already been bought. And I think that's what people miss. How about the um, the ETFs this time around? That's another sort of distinction from the last uh, run up. And you, you touched on the the physical uranium trust there, but you've also got the the Sprott miners and the the Sprott junior miners trusts. How yeah. do you, how do you think they impact the market? I mean, I guess it's a bit of a microcosm of the the broader stock market and the influences of passive money. But how do you think about that? I can talk to that now that I'm no longer a Sprott officer or director. <laughs> It was odd constructing those ETFs, which I had a lot to do with, 
because at the time I didn't believe in ETFs. Um, the nature of an ETF is that you buy the landscape. And the idea that as an investor, I would pay somebody 40 basis points or 45 basis points for constructing a portfolio that was made up at least half of companies I wouldn't otherwise own with a straight face seemed very odd to me. You know, you're like paying a management fee for somebody to be stupid. Uh, what I've learned is that if a sector is deeply out of favor, uh, and unlike me, the investor has a life. Uh, you know, he has a job, he likes to garden, he reads books, chases girls, whatever he does with his time, and doesn't want to spend all the hours that I spend studying uranium stocks, probably buying an ETF isn't as sinful as I would have believed. And certainly the existence of the Sprott ETF, I think, has been beneficial for the uranium juniors uh, in the sense that individual investors didn't want to take the risk of individual issues and they didn't want to take... They didn't want to take the risk of their own uh, ignorance, not having done the studying. So they could just click a mouse and buy the whole sector, which I think has been good for the sector. Remember that that same click <laughs> can sell ETF <laughs> and the forced buying that you saw can turn into forced selling fairly quickly. Mm. So, you know, I think it'll be an interesting circumstance. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the nature of like passive money in – the entire market must be a phenomenon that you know you've come to grapple with over over your tenure, Rick. And you know, there's this kind of strange reality that you know the big get bigger because of these these dumb flows that you know it's literally click and then buy whatever. There's no there's no real like brain thought that goes into passive money. Um, yeah, how's your evolution of thinking around passive money, both be it you know related to related to one single commodity or just related to the index? Um, like how has it changed over time? That's Sprott, of course, I loved it. Uh, during my tenure, we raised about 25 billion of it mm. uh, at an average of 40 basis points. Uh, and 40 basis points of 25 billion US is a lot, uh, particularly if you don't do much. <laughs> so uh, as a shareholder of a company that harnessed passive money, um, I was ecstatic. From an investor's point of view, I only do things I understand. So the passive flows as an example into technology don't impact me one way or another because if I don't understand the technology, which applies to almost all technology, uh, if I don't understand considerable de co pardon me, consumer durables uh, or retail or any of those things, the flows have nothing to do with me because I'm not in the sector. I don't consider the market itself to be an investment, and I don't consider it to be a source of information. I consider it to be a facility for buying and selling fractional pieces of a business. And if the price on the market is less, hopefully substantially less, then I think the business is worth or will soon be worth, I buy it. If the price exceeds what I think the business is worth, I sell it. Uh, if the other side of that trade is passive, which is to say that the downside is magnified and the upside is magnified, I'm thrilled. I sort of consider myself to be a pawnbroker to the market. I try to buy stuff before the narrative drives the passive money into it, and then I try to sell to the passive money. <laughs> the liquidity event. The catalyst, the rewrite, it's the dumb money. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's true that uh, often, well, always, if I'm successful, I buy too soon. I generally sell too soon, too. And there are those who would suggest that me taking money off the table before the appropriate time makes me the dumb money. Uh, and I'm okay with that as long as I make some, you know. Bernard Baruch, a famous American trader, once said, that the only guy who always bought at the bottom and sold at the top was a liar. It didn't happen. <laughs> and I, I sort of subscribe to that, at least with regards to my own activities. Yeah. There's, a, there's one commodity, Rick, which um, maybe the sentiment's different over there in North America than it is in, in Australia at the moment. But the, the gold – I mean, gold's ripping. Gold's at, you know, in Australian dollars, all-time all highs. Um, yep. Things are really, really bullish. But – the, the equities aren't really reflecting that sentiment. The, the general um, sentiment of, of your everyday punter is, is, is really not all that interested. Maybe it's because we've got the hangover of the, the lithium bust. Um, but 
where, where are your thoughts? I mean, being someone that's attracted to hated <laughs> commodities, like what's your what's your sense around uh, the appeal of gold and gold equities at the moment? Boy, we're going to make a lot of enemies this hour. You know, we've <laughs> That's what we're all about, Rick. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's talk leave, about leave the gold a, leave, leave all the uh, friends to the paid interviews, mate. <laughs> we, we don't need money off companies. You guys aren't paying me? Uh, <laughs> to the exposure. Just in, just in absolute <laughs> love and gratitude, Cobber. Uh, at 71, that's rare, so I'll talk. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about the gold trade a little bit. Uh, it's my opinion in the first instance that people's perception of the future is set by their experience in the immediate past. And for the last 40 years, frankly, investors haven't needed gold. We've had a very benign time. I think that that time ended in 2022. But I don't think that investors yet perceive a need to be defended from the financial s system, uh, in particular U.S. dollar denominated assets, which have done very well. I think they do need to be afraid, but I don't think they're afraid yet. For me, the fact that in U.S. dollars, the gold prices climb from, in a couple of years, 1800 to 2100 doesn't matter a bit. Uh, uh, to me, that's a perturbation. I own gold because I'm afraid, not hopeful, afraid it's going to go to $7,000 or $8,000. I'm afraid that there's a possibility that there's a, a liquidity event in the offing. And I know what the U.S. government would do if there was a liquidity event. I might be wrong. I might be right. I'm no economist. But I've been around a long time, and I know for me it pays to be afraid. But let's look at the equities too, just for fun, not just the commodity. Why is there this big gap between the, the commodity performance and the equity performance? And I would say that the industry has earned it. Costs. If you – if you look back in history to maybe when you guys were in the womb, uh, 2000 to 2010, the gold price in U.S. dollar terms ran from something like 256 to something like 1850, 1900. So a sevenfold increase in the commodity price. Check this out. Median free, free cash flow per share on the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index, the 35 major gold producers worldwide, fell. Now, that takes skill. The selling price of your commodity goes up sevenfold, and the free cash flow for the industry falls. So if the industry is out of favor with investors, that just means that some investors, myself included, have a memory. The performance of the juniors, of course, is worse. Uh, I think we said this on our last interview, but I'll make all of your listeners pissed right now. If you took every junior miner in the world and you merged them together, you got one company, <laughs> Junior Explorco, Right. What, there's 3,000 companies, you make them all one, right? This thing in a very good year, very good year, would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, they'd lose $10 billion. So what would you pay for this business? Would you pay five times losses as a value investor? Say seven times losses in a normalized market, 15 times losses in a good market? Well, you could just have one big fucking tent at the conferences. Like the conferences would <laughs> bloody ruin them. It'd be like a, the whole bloody expo would just be. <laughs> I think the point here is if you invest in the gold mining sector, over two decades, you will go broke. Mate, this bloody G&A expense that these exploration companies, you know, chew through relative to what they raise is preposterous. It shits, it shits me. Yeah, well, it shits me too, Trav. And there's what KCA doesn't waste people's money. No. KCA site services. Because when people give them money, unlike an exploration company, you get something back. You give KCA money, you get an IT, you can get a charge rig, you could get an underground truck, you could get a ute, you could get a grader, mate, you could even get a toilet for <laughs> underground. <laughs> mate, you could even get something that KCA don't even have because KCA will just go and buy that something upon the request from a client. That's just what Adam Wilson and KCA bloody do. When you why, use, can't, why can't exploration companies be like KCA? But when you use KCA for, for anything, guess what? On your bloody cash flow statement, that goes under exploration spend as opposed, to, as, as opposed to admin and corporate. Like, mate, it's just... That shows us yeah. that you're spending your money on the right things and not just... Yourself. Shit. <laughs> Absolute shit. shit. <laughs> Speaking of shit, the four-letter words that uh, Rick has just spoken about, KCA will never be associated with a four-letter word. There's only two, three-letter words that you need to remember. That's KCA 
and yes. Yeah. Because yes is the only word you will hear come out of a KCA member's mouth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, we can do that. Yes, you can hire that off us. And Adam yes, Wilson, we are buying that for you so you can hire it. He'll have the gear there before you even need it. Yes, it's already He's on site. He's waiting for your call. Just pick up the phone. Just say yes. No, just hear yes by calling KCA. <laughs> and on that note, here's Rick Rule. Yes, we will go back to Rick Rule. You need to invest in your own capabilities separated in, in movie terms, the good from the bad from the ugly. Because there's a small subset of companies that have generated such spectacular performance that they add legitimacy to a sector that in a good year only loses $2 billion. So I, I think that the mismatch between gold uh, and the equities is deserved. I think that you are going to see absolutely stunning performance, uh, equity market performance out of the better companies in the sector. And I think you're going to see it in 2024. I don't think you're going to have to wait forever. But I think people who buy the whole sector are going to be disappointed one more time. It doesn't mean they won't get a 200% run or a 300% run. But knowing the market, if they get a 300% run, that 300% run is going to, verify, is going to ver- validate the narrative. And rather than checking out, they're going to double up. <laughs> uh, Do you think it's just the, narrative- the way these markets work. <laughs> Do you think the, the, the appeal and the narrative of gold is, is a lot more complicated in, in an era where, you know, the, the hard money and the sound money guys are, are, are really embracing Bitcoin, which, you know, on, a, on the supply equation is a lot more nah. appealing? You know, I think Bitcoin and gold compete, compete at the margin. You know, for the speculative moron trade, I'm not saying the gold bucks are morons or the Bitcoin, Bitcoin goes are morons. But the total market capitalization in Bitcoin in U.S. dollar terms is about one and a half T. Uh, the latest market cap that I read, total market cap of savings and investment assets in the world is 850 T. Gold and Bitcoin are two separate pimples on a big elephant's ass. They don't matter. And you can't, you can't make team. more Bitcoin, whereas you can make more gold. No, I'm not debating any of that. I understand the Bitcoin argument. All I'm trying to say is that gold's future is in gold's hands. Bitcoin's future is in Bitcoin's mm-hmm. hands. They are such small markets relative to the totality of savings and investment assets in the world that they don't need to compete. They do compete for a small subset of speculators. But what both asset classes need to do, rather than uh, in religious terms, uh, compete to pass collection plates through the choir, is they need to expand the congregation. Did you know, and and I I don't know about Bitcoin, but precious metals and precious metals related assets comprise one half of 1% of all savings and investment assets in the United States. The four decade mean is 2%. If we merely return to mean, demand for precious metals and precious metals related assets in the United States would quadruple. And that's what I think happens over the next five, six years. Bitcoin, I mean, no matter what Bitcoin does, if Bitcoin goes to a million, I don't think it uh, obviates the return to mean market share of precious metals in the U.S. market. Do you, do you think there's going to be other <clears throat> other digital alternatives in the in the future when it be- does become regulated that the physical gold we see now will there will become a digital version or another form of it? This is my this is buddy. I, you'll be well gone by then, Rick. But <laughs> I think you'll see it very quick, very quickly. I know that the Royal Canadian Mint is working on that with the World Gold Council. Uh, You will see uh, gold in a a segregated facility that has been fractionalized and and turned into a token. At the end of the day, it doesn't doesn't work in the same way because you still have to trust someone to reconcile the physical to the digital. It's not a digitally native like thing. It's the same thing as why you can't bloody have, um, <laughs> what, you can't what, track what you're saying that comes from one what, line to another. What you're saying yeah. is that there's, what you're saying is that there's a real asset, of course. There's an, there's an auditor. Uh, you're, you're relying the, on the, trust the, rather than the, the, the only thing where you have to trust is where there's a real asset. With Bitcoin, <laughs> of course, uh, other than the network effect, there's no asset. So you don't have to trust anybody. 
you don't have to perfect your claim because there's nothing to have a claim against. <laughs> so, yes, I understand that you have to hypothecate something and you have to have trust in the physical system. And I understand it's a, it's a, it's a difficulty in the fight with Bitcoin where you don't have to trust anybody because there's no, nothing to trust anybody about. Uh, the value in uh, Bitcoin or in Ethereum uh, is in effect in the ether. Uh, the value in gold is very different. Rick, you touched on um, mean reversion in, in your sort of thesis there, the, the half a percent to, to 2%. And that sort of seems to be a, a theme throughout your your investments. How, how do you think about mean reversion as a sort of, you know, uh, something in your, in your shed of tools as you go and invest in, in sectors, in companies or whatnot? Uh, I'm usually not as arithmetic, as formulaic in other commodities as I am with gold. Mean reversion matters to me in gold because almost all the gold that's ever been mined is still supply. You don't have normal supply demand fundamentals. You know, we do an odd thing with gold. We take it out of a hole in the ground called a mine. We put it in a hole in the ground called a vault. <laughs> Occasionally, old folks like me take it out and pet it for a while before they put it back. <laughs> uh, with most commodities, uh, you look for a commodity where the production, new production, is required by humanity to maintain our material standard of living, meaning that there will be demand five years from now or seven years from now. And you look for a commodity that is so depressed that the selling price of the commodity worldwide is lower than the median cost of production. That leaves you with two alternatives. Either the price goes up or the commodity becomes unavailable. That was the whole uranium thesis. So to me, statistical mean in uranium, uh, because there had to be a price reversion, was at a price where there was e equilibrium between global demand and the industry earning its cost of capital. And we determined in 2022 that that number for existing production and hot stopped production was about 60 US dollars uh, and for greenfields was about $75. I didn't do mean reversion there so much as I did uh, cost of capital and supply demand. Because with gold and silver, almost all the gold that's ever been mined is still supply. Uh, and because I regard it as, a, as an investment rather than a, a, a commodity uh, style asset, I use mean reversion. I like um, always interviewing you, Rick. It's like the, the layout of the the chat is always right. What is real shit at the moment? Because that's probably what Rick's looking at. It keeps it simple, mate. Rare Earths is another one that's been oh, beaten I, up. You know, Are you, have I'm you been really, looking at them? Yeah, and, and Rare Earths are special. I've been working very, very hard on Rare Earths. And the harder I work, the more I, the more I realize how little I know. <laughs> and it, it's, it's such a small industry that finding somebody who knows <laughs> is a bitch. You'll find plenty of people uh, you know, who say they know, but they don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I've I've run into a lot of the a lot of those guys. What I I found two or three people who have to remain nameless right now because I don't want to share them with industry, who seem to know a reasonable bit about rare earths and are also very humble. <laughs> These are people who've been in the business for thirty five years, and think that they have a lot left to learn. Um, and when I talk to them and they tell me how much they have left to learn. I have nightmares about how much I have left to learn, but I absolutely love the sector, uh, a sector that, first of all, is hated, uh, where knowledge is constrained, where the upside in the story is, you know, technology and cell phones and unlimited and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the transition in rare earths from hated to loved uh, could be absolutely mind-boggling, uh, totally mind-boggling. The other thing is I think that there is a, um, uh, I think there's a price catalyst or perhaps two price catalysts in place. I, I think the Chinese understand that rare earths aren't rare, <laughs> that we haven't looked for them because the Chinese have produced them so efficiently. Why would you look for something that you're going to lose 35 or $40 a ton on, you know? Uh, uh, but I also think, uh, and I've seen it firsthand, that the low cost associated with Chinese production comes hand in hand with massive environmental degradation in Western China. 
Mm-hmm. And what you learn about people is that they get, as they get more rich, they get less tolerant uh, of those sort of costs. And I believe that the Chinese mining industry will, in the fairly near term, uh, adapt uh, environmental practices in their rare earths business that raise the cost of rare earths substantially. I also believe that uh, as we're concerned about the security of global supply chains and we explore for areas that are prospective for rare earths, that we're going to find some. I don't think they're rare. I just don't think we found them because it hasn't paid us to look. Recall. So I love that sector. On that point on China and their, you know, the way that they might think about their um, environmental impact, I mean, we, it obviously happened in the West. We were happy to export our environmental yep. externalities to China yep. as they, yep. you know, became industrialized. Do you, do you see a similar thing that the Chinese will ultimately do and they'll want to, as they, you know, become, uh, you know, wealthy um, and will they, will they look to export those same externalities themselves? And where to? Uh, if you're talking about if you're talking about exporting externalities in effect by uh, importing stuff exactly. from countries where environmental standards are lower, yeah, the answer to that is absolutely yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're doing it right now. Uh, who who are the we, beneficiaries of that from the you know the global growth story? Well, uh, if if you would describe uh, as a benefit uh, making money by lowering your environmental standards and wrecking your country. Uh, I guess you need to look at places like Indonesia, Congo, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, places like that. And by the way, the Chinese mining practices in their own country right now aren't world class. But I certainly remember Australian, Canadian and American mining practices in the 1970s when I grew up in the industry. And let's say I'm not proud about what we did then. (laughs) It's something that happens to societies as they they can afford uh, to care. Matty, you uh, you touched on the the subject of Rick. You liking to to uh, speak about topics that are massively beaten up, and this one's a bit more abstract. But something we've been hearing a fair bit here, Rick, is that the the North American and in part as well the the London Exchange is you know in quotation marks broken for juniors trying to trying to raise capital, and you know a, the ASX is a bit more. Um, versatile in that regard in, in terms of being able to fund exploration and so on. Do you have a, a bit of insight or can you speak to that given you've got feet on the ground in, in North America? I, I think the exchanges are extremely efficient. I think the industry has wasted so much money for 50 years that the investors are on strike. I think it's a very good thing. We would have a very healthy junior sector if 2,000 listings worldwide went to listings heaven. (laughs) Uh, The industry is ridiculously overfunded. I mean, it's insanely overfunded. Uh, An industry that destroys $2 billion a year in capital shouldn't be able to raise capital under any terms and conditions. What's wonderful about the industry from my point of view is that the investors are on strike for everybody. You find Ross Beatty companies that are selling at discounts that normally would apply to companies run by the Three Stooges. Uh, It isn't the exchange's fault that the investors are as dumb as they are. It isn't the exchange's fault that the brokerage houses can be as greedy and larcenous with these dumb investors as they are. Um, I, I I think the market needs to be more efficient. On that, uh, on the you topic know, we of- we, we, let me go, let me get more people to hate me for a little while. Fuck it, keep, we had keep a, rolling it, Rick. Keep on a roll, mate. We had a young intern about 20 years ago, very smart young guy. Uh, and uh, I asked him to pull 25 then VSE, now TSX companies at random, and pull five years balance sheets and five years income statements Uh, and tell me the one prevailing good trend and the one prevailing bad trend. You know, he tried to get out of me what I wanted, but since I didn't know what I wanted, I couldn't tell him. I didn't tell him that. I said, these will be obvious to you when you look, which was total lie. Anyway, (laughs) in about two weeks, he calls me. He says, well, I couldn't find the good trend, Rick, except these guys are keep keep being able to raise money. I said, what's the bad trend? He says, oh, well, that was easy. I said, yeah, help me. 
He said, well, of 25 companies, not an accurate statistical sample, the average company spent more than 60% of the money raised on GNA and less than 40% went in the ground. And that's likely not sustainable. Now, the industry <laughs> has consumed immense amounts of money on GNA every year for 45 years. Uh, and they keep saying to the market, send new money, old money all gone. And the market has finally, you know, shown them the international high sign of unfriendliness, <laughs> you know, that extended middle finger. And now that the companies can't raise money to sustain their lifestyles, they're blaming the exchange. So what if you're knowing that is true and you're targeting or sort of that end of town for the, you know, the five, 10, 20 baggers that you, yeah. you bloody love and everyone loves, how do you then differentiate which ones to go to and which ones to uh, hopefully head off to listing heaven? I start with serially successful people in bad markets. So a Ross Beatty or a Robert Friedland right now, when their companies are priced the same way the companies run by the Three Stooges are priced. Uh, I look for targets that are at the very least high quality tier two or better off tier one targets, particularly with commodities that are out of favor. Um, I look for general and administrative expense uh, above and below the line, which is to say, including GNA that's spent at the project level, to be less than 20% of capital raised. And in particular, I look, having cleared as many of those obstacles as I can, to a management team that can describe for me in detail the path to creating value. If they're an exploration company, I want to know what the principal unanswered question is that they're trying to answer. I want to know what they think the probability of a yes answer is. I want to know the question that will result from a yes answer. I want to know what will constitute a no answer so they can quit spending money. Uh, I want to know the time frame it's going to take to get me a yes answer, how much money it's going to take me to get a yes answer, and I want to know that they have the money. That process is the process I use to compete with speculators whose process is got a hunch, bet a bunch. Uh, mercifully for me, this is not a fair fight. Uh, any of your listeners, this is an un, uh, uh, unblemished commercial, any of your listeners who go to the rural classroom can see 200 hours of instructional programming about how I do what I do. Uh, and more than one person who has been through that has said, I'm going to buy savings bonds. You know, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not going to do this. I have a life. <laughs> but since you asked, uh, there are easy, uh, not always successful, but easy ways to separate the good from the bad from the ugly. So what 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 is on your radar at the moment in in these beaten up in the toilet commodities? Well, I like gold. Uh, I like it because I think there's a probability that the increase in the gold price will surprise people. It might not happen in 2024. I think U.S. interest rates stay stronger than most people think they will. Uh, but I think the damage that the world's reserve currency has done itself is greater than most other people think. Uh, and I think investors that own long bonds, U.S. dollar denominated long bonds, <laughs> I think they're on illegal drugs. So I'm attracted to the gold price and I'm attracted to the hate that you see in the gold sector. I'm attracted to a market that's irrational enough that when Panama nationalizes Cobre Panama, which accounts for 15% of the market cap of Franco Nevada, that Franco Nevada sells off by 42%. <laughs> this is a market that can't add or subtract, you know? <laughs> so I love circumstances like that. And I love the fact that that ignorance, which operates at the level of Franco Nevada, is magnified in the sub-300 million market cap space. 
Rick, what do you what do you think of platinum, palladium, the you know platinum metal group, um, and in, in particular, how how do you think about the physical versus the the mining companies? You know, your Sabanyes and yeah, Anglo's implants and whatnot. It's the physical that I own right now. Uh, not surprisingly, the Sprott Physical Platinum and Palladium Trust. Thanks for another commercial. <laughs> uh, I own. Platinum and palladium. I own PGMs really for two reasons. The first is that the bet are against PGMs is a bet that uh, President Biden made that the market for internal combustion engines ends in 2030. Uh, I think that market ends in 2065. So I think that demand for platinum and palladium uh, as a catalyst in automobile applications, but also industrial applications, goes on for as long as we burn stuff. And I think that goes on for a very long time. I also own it because on the supply side, it really comes from three places, it being PGMs. South Africa, a basket case getting worse. Zimbabwe, more of a basket case that couldn't get worse. And Russia. Uh, if something went wrong socially and politically in any of those three places, the supply of PGMs would fall dramatically. Am I saying this is going to happen? No. I'm saying there's a possibility of it, of it happens. And if it happens, the price of those things doubles. So I see a circumstance where there's a possibility of a double with very little possibility of material downside. The catalyst there is when do the Russians run out of supply? Right now, like 1990, the Russians are selling everything on the shelf that they can use to raise money. We saw this happen in 1990. They were selling nickel. They were selling platinum and palladium. You know, they're selling everything they could. Uh, when did it end? It ended when the Russians ran out of supplies to sell. I don't know when that will occur. Uh, you know, Putin doesn't give me any tips. Uh, but when it does, you will see a rebound in PGM prices, maybe even in nickel prices, simply because the seller is gone. But it isn't that that I'm looking for as the catalyst. As a catalyst, I'm looking at the possibility that something really, truly goes wrong uh, socially, in particular in South Africa, but also in Russia. And I may be wrong. When I look at the platinum producers, I mean, <laughs> I own because as an American, I can't sell or buy Norilsk. I'm a Norilsk shareholder, but I'm stuck in limbo between their government and my government, both of which hate me. Uh, and I can't buy Sabanyi Stillwater because I understand the challenges that Neil Froneman faces in South Africa. There is a, a government in place that would very much like to steal the mines, but they can't afford to. Froneman can't invest more in the mines to make them more capital intensive and lower his labor cost. So he's forced to substitute labor for capital. The mine workers are paid pitifully low wages because they're highly inefficient. Their wages have to go up, but their wages can't go up. That conundrum to me is the recipe for explosive violence, which we've seen on the Platte Reef before. So I don't own Anglo Platts and I don't own Sabanyi Stillwater because I've spent too much time down hole in the Platte Reef and I'm aware of the economic conundrum between the need to invest capital and the lack of willingness to do so because you know that the government will steal it at the first opportunity that they have. Was your, was your uranium trade on a similar thesis in terms of the – like when you're talking about PGMs and how it's so concentrated, the fact that uranium, everything was coming out of Kazakhstan and now Kamiko as well. But they're just, as you said before, they're just up here, the amount of supply and then everything else is down here. And it's just if they if they have a 10 percent miss like you need, that's a whole mine that needs to come on for another producer to fill that. Was that pretty similar thinking? No, or it was because more price. The, yeah, the uranium business, uranium was priced so ridiculously low that it had to go up. Uh, I mean, even in societies like the United States that pretend that they're rich enough to do without uranium, uh, uranium is 14% of total power and 18%, 20%, pardon me, of baseload power. The, the equation for me as an American in 2022 was either the uranium price go up to 65 or so U.S., or the lights go out. And which did I think was more certain? 
Well, that was a no-brainer, <laughs> a true no-brainer. Uh, if the price didn't go up to the point where the industry earned its cost of capital, they'd stop producing it. And if they stopped producing it, the lights would go out and they wouldn't just go out in China. They'd go out in the United States. That was a very simple thesis. It was the same thesis in 2020 when COVID caused the oil price to go briefly to zero and then to $20. The numbers were eerily similar. It cost about $60 a barrel fully loaded to make the stuff. I don't mean wellhead cost. I include tax, GNA, cost of capital, 60 US dollars. So the industry is making the stuff for 60, selling it for 20. You compound that with the fact that, the, that uh, Exxon gets kicked out of the Dow Jones, the Dow 30, so all that index selling. A and you have a convergence of events, which is to say a one-off. Exxon can't get kicked out twice, <laughs> only once. <laughs> and the fact that the oil price has to go from 20 to 60, you have one of those one a decade or two a decade, absolute positive no-brainers. And I live for those. What, what do you think about the enrichment side of things with uranium? It's all well and good producing all this uranium, but yeah. if there's yeah. not the enrichment capability around the world, especially to enrich it to Halo for SMRs yeah. if they get adopted, what do you do? You think that's a potential risk for uranium and the power? Well, if you're talking about if you're talking about the fact that 52 percent of the enrichment capacity in the world is in Russia, the answer is no. Uh, last year. During the embargo, American imports of enriched uranium from Russia doubled. <laughs> I won't talk about the politics of that. I'll, I'll leave it to your listeners to comment on the idiocy of both Putin and Biden. I would tell you that uranium is fungible. If the United States does ban Russian uranium, the Russians will sell that uranium to the Chinese and the Indians. And the Australian and Canadian production that went to China and India will come to the United States. It will make absolutely no difference whatsoever. Uh, I do think that worldwide enrichment capacity uh, and worldwide disposal capacity should increase. Now, the country that should do this, the country that has access to the uranium, the country that has access to a stable uh, craton that's dry, the country that has access to a skilled labor force and the rule of law is this truly odd country called Australia, <laughs> uh, a I country where the comment. politicians, you know, get very high caliber weapons, aim them at their own genitals and pull the trigger. <laughs> um, the additional uh, uranium enrichment and disposal capacity should be an Australian business. You have these wonderful, stable, dry cratons where you could dispose of the stuff. And by the way, dispose of it we, so you can get it back because the technology will come to pass uh, where enrichment of depleted tailings gets more efficient. Uh, and you have access to uranium supply. You are trusted around the world. You have wonderful capital markets. You have wonderful scientists. The only thing, unfortunately, you have is politicians that are almost dumb as Americans, uh, which is really a pity. You got that right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll uh, wait and see on that front. Should we wrap up with a uh, <laughs> underrated, overrated, gents? Let, let's do it, JD. All righty. So, Rick, if you're, if you're unfamiliar, I can't remember if we did it last time, but keen oh, to- Oh, I, I wasn't victimized by this last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're going to do is pitch to you a commodity, a company, a, a project, a, a topic, and keen to- Great. Just get your one word taken. You can expand on it if you if you want, but in one word, underrated, overrated. So or right. neutral, <laughs> neutral. Yep. We'll give him we'll give him the ability to be neutral. So, yep. um, I'll I'll start us off with the gold project up in the in the north of WA, Hemi, owned by DeGray. If you're familiar with that one, I don't know it well enough now to comment. Okay. I traded it. <laughs> um, the the West's look, uh, the West's attempt to, you know, build out security of supply away from China. Uh, does the question is involve it, whether they will succeed? Is it is it overrated? Is it overplayed? How much we're trying to, you know, ha, 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 the, the entire focus to build resilience from no. China? Underrated? No. No. Yeah. 
All righty, I've got stupid. A- I've I've got another one. We saw a, a big Australian company, South Thirty Two, just pull the trigger on a huge zinc project. So we didn't speak about zinc in the in the chat there. But what do you think about investing in zinc at the moment? Uh, I like zinc. Uh, I'm less fond of art of Arizona. I wish them well. Uh, trying to build a mine in a place where shop is spelled S H O P P E is always a challenge. <laughs> it's a nice deposit, by the way. Uh, I'm very familiar with it, and I was a pretty major shareholder of the company that sold that deposit to them. Oh, well done to you, mate. <laughs> uh, that, that had a very happy ending for me, and I was very glad to sell it. <laughs> you may be familiar with the resolution deposit in uh, Arizona. It is a uh, 2 billion ton deposit of 1.5% copper controlled by BHP and Rio. It's now been in permitting for 26 years. Mm. Whew. That's wild. What about next gen? Oh, oh, good one. Uh, underrated. Ooh. Underrated. Mm. There you go. If I'm right, uh, about, if I'm right about the, uh, when people look at the upfront capital costs, they aren't taking into account what the upfront capital costs would be, what the cost of capital could be, if NextGen pre-sold 15, 70% of 15 years worth of production to credit quality counterparties, when uh, investors like myself look at the total cost of capital associated with a non-investment grade company building that deposit, that capital in current terms would cost them about 17.5% a year, fully loaded. Uh, my suspicion is that that cost, if they were able to secure uh, 15-year supply contracts with credit quality counterparties, would fall to 12. Uh, what about, uh, I think you were underrated on this one last time, Philo Mining, Philo Corp, Philo Mining. Uh, it, for an investor like me, who is willing to hold it for a very long time, it's probably a little underrated. Uh, certainly given the fact that the share prices enjoyed a sort of a tenfold escalation, I I think you need to look at Vicuña as a district. (laughs) Mm. You need to understand that Philo likely uh, disappears at the appropriate time into the Lundin Maw uh, and that Lundin Mining uh, operates the whole district. Uh, Lucas Lundin, rest in peace, dear friend of mine, uh, said that he regrets every major mine he ever sold. Uh, and I think the boys uh, look at the Vicuña district as their own Grassburg. And it's a stretch, but I think that Lundin Mining could raise the capital to build Vicuña if the current regime, political regime in Argentina uh, can consolidate its grasp in Argentina and, and Argentina returned to some form of fiscal sanity. I have been to Vicuña uh, and I'm very, very, very aware that it's 200 kilometers from anywhere. Uh, I'm aware of the challenges around the infrastructure and I'm aware of the upfront capital costs. But the holes that they've been pulling, uh, eight kilometers apart, nine kilometers apart, the polyphase mineralization that you're seeing in holes, you're seeing holes that are mineralized for a thousand meters. And there's three or four different styles of mineralization in the hole, which suggests, you know, repeated fluid intrusions. My experience has been that those very big deposits always give you surprises, and those surprises are always good. (laughs) On on the topic of Argentina there, Rick, um, Malay's ability to improve the mining regime in Argentina for the long term. Yeah. Uh, He needs to consolidate his grasp on power, uh, and it is by no means certain that he'll be able to do that. He's asking the voters to behave rationally. Uh, which is seldom a successful ask. Uh, He will need to fashion some consensus in Argentina. The fact that he's balanced the budget 
uh, is useful maybe to young people uh, and useful too to the creditors, but not useful to all the bureaucrats who are now unemployed <laughs> or the people whose rice bowls were broken. Uh, there is a whole bunch of sanity that he needs to introduce to Argentina. Uh, and frankly, uh, even bigger than Bacuña would be the shale basins in New Ken and Santa Cruz, the Vaca Muerte. Uh, that basin is likely geologically at least as perspective as the Permian Basin in the United States. The Permian Basin produces 8, 8 million barrels a day of oil equivalent. And the Vaca Muerte produces about 50,000 barrels a day. So Argentina has this absolutely wonderful endowment, the same endowment it's had since the end of World War II. And they have an amazing facility to screw it up. What about, what about the rise of Japan and Korea in downstream lithium processing? I, I think it's a wonderful thing for everybody. Uh to the extent that they decide to build some of that capacity in a place like Australia or Argentina, it nourishes to the benefit of Argentina and Australia. To the extent that it allows the Japanese manufacturers to be more efficient uh, providers of battery, it nourishes to the benefit of the world's consumers. To the extent that a secure supply chain benefits the big uh, Japanese kiritsu, it nourishes to the benefit of that, them. I, I, I think it's wonderful. Uh, absolutely positively wonderful. Now, if you happen to be in the downstream business and your cost of capital is higher than the Japanese or you're less efficient than the Japanese or you can't uh, distribute products as efficiently as the Japanese, it's hard on you. Shame on you. <laughs> you can imagine the extent of my concern for the inefficient producer. Rick, I've got one last one. Underrated or overrated, the implications of the, the USA's Inflation Reduction Act. Oh, my. Oh, we got him. <laughs> I'm, I thought you'd have I'm a take on this I'm struggling to use words that can be used in public. Oh, you could use them on our show, mate. You're right. You choose overrated or underrated. It is absolutely <laughs> disgusting what they named that act. It, it, should, be, it should be named the... Um, Political Sauce Making Subsidy Act of 2023. Uh, I actually felt better when President Biden was vilifying me for being in the uranium business than I do now that he's proposed to subsidize me to the extent of $5 billion a year. How on earth does spending money that you don't have qualify as fighting inflation? And the American taxpayer and the American voter uh, illiterate and innumerate, uh, seems to be in favor of it. There was a great American journalist named H.L. Mencken. And Mencken famously said, the voters almost always get what they really want, usually good and hard. Uh, and I think that's the fate of American taxpayers as a consequence of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's a despicable piece of legislation. Oh, I reckon Make sure your politicians look smart. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, fuck it. They need all the help they can get. Uh, I think that's a good one to sign off on, Jess. Bloody chance. beautiful, Ricky. Thank you very much, mate. Great to have you on as always, mate. How many potties have you done this week? Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I've been Inbox busy. must get full. By the way, you guys didn't let me do my commercial, so I'm going to do it. Oh, rip it out, mate. Uh, anybody who's listening to Money of Mine uh, needs to know that if you think I know something about resources and you want to talk to me about yours, go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks, including your Aussie stocks. If I know them, I'll rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. If I think my comments have some value, I'll comment on them. While you're there, go over to the rural classroom. We have 200 hours of instructional programming, absolutely free. And by the way, it's worth more than that. Uh, if you want to give me some money though, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, we do something called the boot camps. We have one coming up in April, an exploration and prospect generation boot camp. $99 US, uh, eight hours of programming. If you don't think you got your $99 worth, email me. Money back gold, uh, guarantee, gold plated. By the way, too, I'm coming to Australia. I have a joint venture now with the Mining Journal where they'll be uh, helping me with my conferences and I'll be helping them with their conferences. So I look forward 
to uh, not making Australians have to come to North America to my conferences, but rather bringing my tired old carcass to you, to yours. When When's that, Rick? Uh, I, I can't come to this year's conference. They uh, scheduled it over my wife's birthday, which is a step too far. Uh, but I will certainly be to the two mining journal conferences in Australia in 2025. We're, ha- we're hanging on for dear life, mate. We'll be there. We'll be there, yeah. mate. Assuming, assuming I live that long. Right? <laughs> <laughs> mate, thanks, thanks again, mate. Always great to chat with you. And bloody, uh, I think we all, the whole community gets good value out of it. So thanks very much, mate. Legend. Thank you, Rick. Well, always a pleasure. I'm a fan of, of y'all. So thank you. Cheers. Likewise, Cheers, mate. Rick. Cheers. Bye. Oh, good work, Ricky Rule. What a bloody legend. How good is he? Always good for a, a hot take. Good to have him back on the show again. Yeah. Can't wait to do one in person with Rick. Yeah. Mm. That'd be good. Get on the ginger beers with him. <laughs> I want to yeah. hear him uh, say some swear words, mate, and I reckon he'll only do that in person. Yeah. He's yeah, going to do it anyway. Do it on Money of Mine. <laughs> if he's going to rip out an F-bomb, it's on Money of Mine. Yeah. All righty. Thanks to our partners. Oh, bloody. As always, who do we have at the top of the show? We had KCA. We had DSI Underground. Great companies in the underground mining industry. Bloody, you'd be mad if you're not using them. You're mad if you're not using Verify. You're mad if you haven't got a get wet bladder on your site. Mate, you're mad if you haven't got a Smec VSD powering your secondary ventilation. You're mad if you haven't got Seamus Murphy and Anytime Exploration involved in your company some way. And well, you're mad if you're not flying Brooks Airways to site, and you are bloody mad if K drill aren't drilling your exploration holes. Yes, we can, Maddie. Yes. Who to root? Who to root, money miners? The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.